All right, everyone, we'll call back the meeting to order. Uh, it's my opinion that all members are present and accounted for. Um, so we will now begin our presentation uh, part of the hearings. Madam Clerk, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to committee regulations as set by the bylaws, each requesting entity is entitled to a total presentation not to exceed 30 minutes, with 15 minutes for the line item presentation and 15 minutes for question by the committee. Additionally, no member may interrupt the presenter during their 15 minute presentation, except for the chair. At the conclusion of each presentation, the chair shall open the floor to questions. Members must seek recognition prior to addressing the presenter. The chair reserves the right to silence a member if they speak out of turn or are not called on. Finally, the chair shall regulate the question period, ensuring that similar questions are not asked more than twice. Are there any questions about those, uh, about the procedure? Seeing none, you may continue. Mr. Chairman, presentation number one is student engagement advocacy and leadership and EOF WSU student of the year. Their request is located on page two of the fees binder. All right. So welcome and thank you for uh, coming to present this committee. You will have 15 minutes to present and 15 minutes for questioning. Um, your line item, you must cover topics that you think the committee will, will help the committee in its decisions. Um, and we will begin with introductions from the committee. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and chair of the student fees committee. My name is Camila Gums and I serve as the student body vice president. My name is Leticia Murdoch and I represent the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. My name is John Kirk and I am the budget and finance chair for the student government. My name is Jacqueline Villa, and I represent grad school. My name is Nathan Rongish, and I represent the College of Fine Arts. My name is Tegan Altenberg, and I am representing the College of Health Professions. I'm Sheila Surrender, Executive Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships. Terry Hall, Vice President for Student Affairs. Werner Golding, Vice President for Finance and Administration. Lindsay Pletcher, University Budget Office. Hi, David Miller from the University Budget Office. Hello, Jason Post from the Budget Office. John Ramey representing the Barton School of Business. Gladys Heitzman representing the Honors College. I'm Jacob Tubach, I'm the Speaker of the Student Senate. And Elisa Bridge, Clerk of the Student Senate. All right, and with that, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Student Fees Committee. My name is Gabriel Fonseca, and I serve as the Director for Student Engagement, Advocacy, and Leadership. Uh, I'm going to take my SGA hat off really fast and put on my other one. Uh, joining me is Randy, and I'll let her introduce herself as well. Hi, my name is Randy Beggs. I'm the Assistant Director in Student Engagement, Advocacy, and Leadership. So um, I put a presentation together to kind of help visually talk a little bit about our request. Um, so I want to kind of start off with explaining uh, the, the name of our office and kind of where we are. Um, so we, um, this past year, began a process of rebranding um, the former Student Involvement Office and into our, uh, our new office, Student Engagement, Advocacy, and Leadership. Uh, the hope of this, um, of this effort was a, a change at that moment uh, where we looked at um, the needs of uh, what student involvement was doing at that time um, and kind of trying to fit in with the overall uh, bigger picture of the Division for Student Affairs. Um, we moved the activities aspects of student involvement, so the Student Activities Council, uh, into campus recreation and they're uh, presenting tomorrow to kind of talk a little bit about that. And then everything else that um, was a part of student involvement remained within our office. Um, 
So in January of this past year is when we launched our new brand uh, and our new name and our new mission and purpose for our office as well. Um, one thing that, and, we'll, and I'll kind of go over it in just a second, but our new purpose and vision and, and values were adopted by engaging with students uh, through focus groups and conversations we've had with student leaders from a variety of our areas in our office, uh, as well as our uh, staff in the department that kind of helped create those new pieces. Um, we really kind of talk about that these are the signature engagement uh, experiences and opportunities, really the hub for, uh, for engagement, for advocacy and leadership. Um, so the, the purpose of our office, um, SEAL exists to facilitate an engaged campus culture where students are empowered to maximize their potential by creating opportunities for personal growth and real world readiness, with the vision to inspire the next generation of world ready leaders to advance the communities they serve. So we really see these two aspects um, as the work that we do, um, and more importantly, that every service we provide, every opportunity we provide fits into both of these uh, within our purpose and our mission as well. Within our office, um, we oversee all of the student organizations on campus uh, and play a part in supporting the, the student leaders who are responsible for those organizations. Uh, we have their civic engagement initiatives, which include their community service board and our alternative breaks program, as well as our Shockers Vote initiative. Um, we house our fraternity and sorority life organization, so the 24 uh, chapters that we have on campus. Um, we also recently um, are responsible for the National Student Exchange, um, which is a study away program uh, for current students at Wichita State to visit other campuses and spend a semester at another university, and for those students who also come to our campus too. Um, we also house our leadership development programs, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, and then um, support the Shocker 360 initiative. The office also provides administrative support to the student government uh, and to the Shocker support locker. So this is kind of just um, a quick kind of highlight of what uh, services and, and aspects exist within our department. Some of our sig signature experiences that hopefully some of you have participated in um, are involvement in community fair, which is typically in August, um, Ruth's big event, which is a big community service program both in the fall and the spring, uh, family weekend, song fest, homecoming, spring fest, uh, leadership, our lead conference, and summer leadership institute. These are just some of the highlights, um, but we also host a variety of different kinds of, of pieces as well. Um, you'll see in your binders, I won't spend too much time kind of talking about it, but you'll notice in there aspects of how we support uh, Wichita State University's um, strategic plan. Um, and we highlighted four of them. Uh, goal one with student centeredness, goal three with campus culture, goal four with inclusive excellence, and goal five with partnership and engagement. Um, and then you can kind of see again on, on your binder what pieces we do and then also um, on the screen too. Um, and then we talk a little bit, or I want to share a little bit about things that we believe are benefits of engagement, not only based off of, um, of studies that were done, but also within um, information that we've collected from assessments. Um, you know, we believe that being engaged on campus, involved on campus in some aspect, uh, is more than likely for students to stay at Wichita State and to graduate, um, to develop personal and professional uh, skills, soft skills, those opportunities as well, to build networks of friends and professionals, attend national conferences when able, right? COVID didn't allow us to do that. Uh, but to also to gain new skills and ultimately have fun uh, as well. Um, some of our highlights for the past fiscal year, keeping in mind this is from summer and fall, um, we, of our student organizations, um, we ho they hosted 486 campus uh, events, both on campus and off campus. Um, student, seven students traveled with National Student Exchange in the past year. Um, our community service board hosted 27 volunteer opportunities. Uh, our MGC quad, which is right outside uh, the Radigan Student Center, um, it's fi was finally completed this year with the opening of our three new pillars for our three new, uh, three new organizations that uh, joined the uh, Multicultural Greek Council. Um, we participated in 26 outreach initiatives. Uh, our leadership program uh, hosted 50 students this year. Um, and then on our Shocker 360 platform, 9,136 activities were completed. So those are things that students um, successfully completed and got credit for on our Shocker 360 platform. 79% of our student leaders were retained and 84% um, of our members of organizations were retained. Um, and then when I kind of put in there kind of the academic aspect in fall 2021, um, we calculate the GPAs of all of our student leaders within our office. Um, and that was 3.21 of, of leaders and members with the university average being a 3.016. So we exceeded uh, the university GPA. Uh, and then we had an increase of 0.23 um, for event satisfaction, inclusion, and belonging. So all this data was collected through all of our various assessments that we do um, throughout the year. 
So I want to kind of highlight uh, our request for this year. Um, we are asking for an additional $45,000, um, and I'll kind of break down how we, um, what those are going to go towards. Um, in our office, we house uh, three to four graduate assistants um, that help support the areas of our department. Um, right now, uh, we're getting ready to go into our grad weekend in April, but we hire a fraternity and sorority life grad assistant, um, a civic engagement grad assistant, leadership development, um, our, and a few others uh, with our assessment um, and strategic planning position. So a couple things based off of the needs of the department. Um, traditionally in the past, those positions have been funded um, out of reserves, and so leftover dollars um, not necessarily dollars that were within the budget. And so my hope as we begin to develop the, the needs of, of our office and the needs of our department, um, that this is a thing that we are providing uh, for, for students who are coming into a higher education program, uh, and we want to provide them these experiences. And so um, for us, it's important that we um, put the funding in our budget since it's a part of our operational uh, need for the department. So that $15,000 uh, will cover um, the remaining portion of the grad assistants uh, from their stipends, uh, healthcare, uh, and their tuition um, costs that we go into the package um, from the graduate school. Um, the second request is um, an additional, right? the first two are permanent, uh, parts to our budget and the other two are, um, are newer things, but um, the, we host our leadership initiative, uh, which I kind of talked a little bit about earlier. Um, it's a, a, a four day um, conference and experience for uh, students. We take them off campus and go to a retreat site uh, and we teach them how to be um, effective leaders of, of tomorrow. We teach them to work on, on visions and development and opportunities and experiences to engage uh, with a variety of different aspects. Uh, we get students from all over campus. Um, it's an accomplishment, a part of our Engineering Plus and our Honors, yeah, our Honors uh, College as well, so students can also get academic credit for this experience. Um, and I'll turn it over to Brandy to see if she has anything else specifically uh, that she wants to add about leadership. Well, that was it, perfect, then I handled that well. Um, so again, part of that as well has always been funded out of reserves, um, and it's an initiative that we continue to host uh, every year. Um, we finally think we found a good period to do it in the fall semester, um, and so we're asking for uh, the $20,000 to cover the cost for that uh, in the fall, uh, or to have, have that permanently as well. And then the last two things, um, one of them is a new initiative that our office is going to look into based off of survey data and assessment that we've done and completed uh, to look at off-campus uh, and non-traditional student support. Um, we're not 100% sure what that's not going to look like, but I think when we think about um, our campus, and I think all of you can, can uh, connect to this in some aspect, Wichita State's very unique that we serve students from all spectrums of traditional 18 to 23 year olds to non-traditional students and adult learners uh, and international students. And so we wanna be able to, uh, we're creating this new initiative in our area to kind of help um, with engaging our off-campus students and our non-traditional students in ways of how involvement can look like for them uh, and engagement within our department as well. And then the final uh, request is um, an increase to our retreat site. So in a year, we probably do um, about five different retreats from all of our areas, uh, and as prices go up and as costs go up for rentals, these spaces, uh, as we kind of looked what those are, um, an additional $5,000 would help us um, ensure that those pr programs and those contracts continue to be funded uh, as well throughout the year. Uh, and then the last piece of our request, uh, we're not asking for anything additional, but it is a part of our EOF. Um, we house the uh, student leader, the student of the year comp uh, scholarship competition, um, and that information is also located in there. But we're not asking for an increase to that EOF fund; just a continuance of that of that of those dollars. Um, and that is all that I have for you guys. And I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for the presenters at this time, uh, Representative Rongish? Yeah, so I was wondering, um, how many, do the students pay any money for those retreats, or, or do you guys like pay for all of that? Um, we have them pay um, a deposit, but it's returned back to them when they attend, but they don't cover, they don't pay any cost to attend those retreats, and any of the five ones, they don't pay for those. Any other, oh, Representative Kirk. Yeah, I was not able to find it in here. What is the, um, how high is the attendance for um, all of the retreats and everything that we do through your office? 
So typically the retreat site maximum is 60 and more often than not, we're able to max out and get 60. Um, this past leadership was the first time that we weren't able to reach the maximum, but we still ended up with 50 participants. Um, and then we did have 60 on the roster, um, but had people drop out. So we weren't able to fill those spots. And I would add that, that we do, for all of our retreats, we typically max out for the capacity that we hold. Um, I think our smallest one is 30, and our largest being leadership at 60. I don't know that math real fast. I'm just trying to do math for you, sir. About 300-ish students per year. per year. Any other questions? Speaker to Uh Yeah, so looking at the off-campus non-traditional student support, uh, the $5,000, can you just give us a little insight as to why that number was chosen? Uh, I, I know you said earlier that they're not entirely sure how that would be spent, but can you give us kind of a ballpark of, of that number? Yeah, so I think as we um, enter into the, the exploration of that new piece, um, I think the 5,000 was kind of basing it off of um, right our outreach and engagement, sorry, our outreach and engagement opportunities uh, with with the population of students. Um, I think that was a, I, the I will say probably the, the lowest amount that I felt like putting in there um, as we especially go into our first year of really thinking about what that's going to look like for us um, with that population. I mean, a substantial percent of our students live off campus and or even our percentage of non-traditional students continue to increase. Um, this more than likely will help us um, at, a, at a good first year base level to be able to do uh, that outreach and engagement with them. Um, again, what that's going to look like, not 100% sure just yet, um, but that's kind of the adventure we're going to explore this semester and into the summer. Uh, follow up. So do you think that potentially that $5,000 is, is more for a personnel cost or like a, uh, in, in terms of outreach, you know, what, what is that usually spent on? Is it materials, is it, is it personnel? Um, I would probably say for um, materials, for programming, for our marketing efforts for those areas, um, our office hosts our transfer student social and our graduate student social in partnership with the graduate school. Um, and so I think that would go in there to help subsidize some of those pieces, um, but also um, a little bit more targeted to adult learners and our, again, than our non-traditional students that we typically at the moment don't have something unique or special to them that I think we, based off of assessment we've collected, um, would in uh, enhance those experiences of those students as well. Um, Representative. Um, to piggyback off of what Speaker Tubak was um, going towards, did um, to get that 5,000, were you using um, any other uh, campuses or universities around or is that just what we y'all came up to? So when we were researching possibilities of things to do, uh, we engaged with um, our region institutions to see what the other schools here in Kansas do, um, as well as what our um, peer and aspirational institutions, the schools that are similar to us, the schools that we aspire to be, um, as far as looking at kind of ideas and things that we could develop here um, that were being done at other, other, at other institutions. Um, and so I think when we looked at it, it was more of uh, trying to keep it minimal um, as we kind of investigate the, the possibility of what this initiative might look like uh, for our campus. Any other questions for the speakers? Uh, speaker Tubon. Uh Yeah, so I was just looking at um, the additional revenue column. We were looking at the uh, item two in the binder. And I was just curious about, uh, so you had 22,400 as a number for the additional revenue. Um, can you just kind of explain uh, where that number comes from? You know, what it kind of will look like in the future, if it will go up or down, or what the anticipation is uh, about that? Yeah, so we do host some um, of our events, um, more specifically in our uh, signature events that um, come at a, at a ticket cost. Um, and so that uh, 22400 specifically um, comes from uh, registration costs for some of our events um, and or um, ticket sales for um, other pieces. Um, a piece of that, so we host our alternative breaks program, um, and a piece of those dollars are fundraised with the students who are interested in going. And so when we put the 22000 um, it's anticipating that we'll raise about $10,000 to cover the cost of that program uh, because we don't... Um, 
we don't utilize a, a lot of our dollars to cover the cost for that because it's a, it's a group of students who want to go tra to take this travel experience. Um, and so half of that is dollars that are raised every year um, from the students who are participating in, in our alternative breaks program. Um, roughly, if it wasn't a COVID year, some of our previous years um, had anywhere between 12 to 15 to 20 students traveling. Um, and so a part of them going is also them raising the dollars. And so a portion of that 22 um, is also projecting the fact that we'll raise um, a portion of the dollars to cover the cost of the alternative breaks program. And that would be the largest piece of, of that 22,000. Representative Rongish. Uh, I was just gonna ask what your uh, thoughts are on the importance of keeping the, the leadership retreats free for students. Is there a reason why um, in the past you haven't asked them to uh, like pay any money for it? Is it like uh, is it affordable for them? What, what's the importance of uh, keeping it free for them? I think it's important for, in our perspective to keep almost all of our offerings free um, to ensure that every student on campus is able to participate and so that we're not adding barriers. Um, even a small fee of $50, which used to be our deposit amount, has prevented students from being able to participate before. And so we've seen that that really does put up a barrier for a large population that's interested in the program, and it's important to us to keep it free so that everyone can participate if they wish. Representative Kirk. Um, and to be clear, while um, when we promote these uh, retreats and everything, that is clearly communicated to the students that it is free. Yes, um, if it is one of those, like I would say, right, and, and Randy mentioned, um, and I mentioned earlier that we have a deposit just to hold the spot, um, and we have decreased it substantially, um, mainly because, right, if we, like, let's say, Randy and I are going, and we're the people going to the conference, but Randy doesn't show up at the department, we're still spending the dollars to have Randy come, and so um, we have the deposit purely as a, in order for us to hold that spot, but once they attend, they, then they, it, the deposit is lifted. Uh, but yes, when we do advertise all of our retreats, it is advertised that it is free for students, um, for Wichita State students. Speaker Subak. Oh, follow up from Representative Kirk. Yeah, to be clear, roughly what would the um, deposit for one of these be? $50. I'm sorry, you, yeah, thank you. It's okay. Speaker Tubok. Uh Yeah, looking at item four, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your reserves uh, and a little bit about volunteer ICT and Chucker Sink and how that impacts uh, your estimated reserves. Yeah, so, um, Shocker Sync is our student organization management software. Um, it is how we uh, manage our, our over 200 student organizations and how they manage their organizations as well. Um, it is an expensive platform um, and traditionally in a three year contract, uh, which is how we sign that contract for, uh, it's roughly, um, I'm just gonna round up to go to $68,000 to cover the cost of that contract for three years. Um, our reserves right now is the way that we pay for that contract. Um, as we've had some discussions about, uh, about priorities and needs in one of those aspects, um, I think putting in a $68,000 request into our student fees budget uh, may be probably not possible. And so we use dollars that, we rely on dollars that we don't spend um, in every year from position vacancies um, or from event cancellations or whatever it might be to cover that cost. Uh, volunteer ICT on the flip side is our management system for um, service event or service initiatives within the community. Um, it's a partnership between us and United Way of the Plains of Wichita uh, to be able to provide um, our nonprofit organizations in the city um, an avenue to get student volunteers. Um, and so that system and that platform manages um, the service experiences and opportunities for our students. Um, it's also paid for out of reserves um, because those are costs that are every three years. Um, in for the aspect of shocker things in every three year cost, um, we put money to the side every year to cover the cost of that initiative uh, or of that, of that platform. And this is the end of our third year, so we will be um, renegotiating that contract as well. And then volunteer ICT is an annual um, expense that we, that we ask for, uh, but that price varies as well based off of the number of agencies that are located on it. Um, so those are the substantial aspects to their expense of our reserves. Um, and was there a second part of your question? Sorry. 
No, that, that pretty much was what I was looking for. Uh, but I, if I may follow up, um, I was just going to ask, do you see this as a, as a sustainable way to continue funding these projects, or do you think that potentially reserves could, I mean, obviously reserves can, can fluctuate a lot, so, uh, yeah. Yes, I would argue that it is probably not a sustainable way, um, but it is, I guess, I, I would say it is the best way we have at the moment to do so, but as I argue with the use of reserves anyways, um, that, right, it's, we get, I don't know if this is a lucky thing or not, right? But when we don't have a position filled, then we have salary savings that we can put towards that. Um, but in the event that we're not in that year where we have salary savings or anything, um, then it's gonna be up to us to kind of figure out from within how we're gonna cover that cost of that contract. Um, so I would say it's not a sustainable way, but knowing the, the costs of these platforms um, and the importance to what, how they tie back to, our, to the functioning of our, some of our areas, um, that is probably the best way we have at the moment to do so. And, sorry if I can, also, sorry, one more thing to add. Um, every three years, the contract costs also goes up, um, and so we have to also bet on, on those pieces too. Any other questions? Speaker Tubak. Sorry for monopolizing the microphone. Um, it's just a force of habit. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, moving on to, you were talking about vacant positions. Uh, on item nine, uh, is the assistant director part-time position uh, is listed as vacant, no change. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about that position and, and if it's going to be filled or if that is required to be paid or if it'll be sweeped into reserves? Uh, that is my fundamental hope that we'll get it filled. Um, a part of the change to, so right, I, I used to be the assistant director, um, and a part of that change when I uh, took the on director position is that my old position would be filled. Um, and so we are actually in the middle of launching all of our searches for the open positions that we have and anticipate all of those being filled um, by June 1. Any other questions for the speakers? Oh, John Remy. I'm Representative Remy, my bad. Um, for Shocker Sync, most of my experience with it has been on the management side of the RSOs we have on campus. I was curious, do you guys have any data on what Shocker Sync kind of brings to students that are looking to get involved? Because I guess the reason I asked for my experience, it was kind of something that I became more familiar with once I was already in the organization, but it isn't what brought me in. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so we, uh, two years ago, changed our marketing strategy with Shocker 36 or Shocker Sync uh, because a, a big function of it is uh, our student organization management. And so, right, if you are a president or a treasurer um, or coordinate events for your organization, you probably live on that system um, all the time. We have uh, student groups who uh, now turn it into a verb of like, oh, we got to Shocker Sync that. And so, um, right, from an, an organization operational standpoint, you probably spend a lot of time. So two years ago, um, we shifted our, our marketing um, and how we communicate the usage of this platform platform um, to now be right that centralized hub of are you trying to are you trying to get engaged on campus involved on campus see what events are happening um, and so we've retweaked it so that if you're not one of those three people who spend your entire life on it that you're just a student who's looking to get involved um, that now um, we're starting to see increases in, in students in I don't want to use regular students, but regular students utilizing the platform and the system uh, because it is now, right, we've retweaked how we share and communicate that. Um, so I would say that um, our platform and the numbers that I just pulled um, has about 7,000 students on it who are using it. Um, and I would argue um, that probably four or 5,000 of those are non-student leader positions or people who are utilizing the platform in some capacity. And whether that is they're listed as a member of an organization um, or they checked in for attendance at an event, um, so in some capacity they're utilizing the system that's not on the organizational um, uh, functional, uh, functionality side of it. Yeah. have time for one more question. All right, seeing none, thank you so much for your time. And I believe the next presenters are ready as well. So, Madam Clerk. Yeah. 
Mr. Chairman, presentation number two is student conduct and community standards. The request is located on page 13 of the fees binder. Thank you so much for joining us today for your presentation. Uh, you have 15 minutes to go over your line item um, request and provide any information you think is necessary for committee to know. Uh, after that, we will set aside 15 minutes for us to ask you questions. But now we'll start with introductions. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and chair of the student fees committee. Good afternoon. My name is Camila Gums, and I'm the student body vice president. My name is Letitia Murdoch, and I'm the representative I'm the representative for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. My name is John Kirk, and I am the Budget and Finance Chair for the Student Senate. My name is Jacqueline Villa, and I, re I represent grad school. My name is Nathan Rongish. I represent the College of Fine Arts. My name is Tegan Altenberg, and I'm representing the College of Health Professions. Shilu Surrender, Financial Aid and Scholarships. Terry Hall, Vice President for Student Affairs. Werner Golding, Vice President for Finance and Administration. Lindsay Pletcher, University Budget Office. David Miller, University Budget Office. Jason Post with the Budget Office. John Ramey, representing the Barton School of Business. Gladys Heitzman, representing the Honors College. My name is Jacob Tubach, and I'm the Speaker of the Student Senate. Annalisa Bridge, Clerk of the Student Senate. And with that, you may begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. So my name is Kyle Wilson. I serve as the Director of Student Conduct and Community Standards here. I have Aaron Austin as well, who is Dean of Students. Do you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the Student Conduct and Community Standards budget. I'm going to start kind of talking a little bit about our office, um, highlight our mission, our vision of creating responsible shockers, um, and the values that we have. Um, those values are listed in alphabetical order. Um, accountability, community, equity, growth, integrity, respect, and then probably the most important for us is safety um, on campus. If we look a little bit at our numbers, um, this year has been incredibly busy for us. Um, if you look at the 21-22 line there, um, keep in mind this is not obviously a whole academic year because we're only in February, um, and almost all of those numbers are substantially larger than what we have from 2020-2021, um, which was last academic year. Um, academic integrity has really taken a big um, push forward in our office um, and has been keeping us extremely, extremely busy in the fall and spring semester. Um, I also wanted to touch on that discrepancy between the housing number dropping so far low um, and then the info only number kind of dropping or uh, raising a lot higher. Um, we went through a philosophical shift for our office this academic year and um, we decided that it was more important to um, help students learn, grow, and educate them um, on some of the lower level housing violations. And so if it's the first time they've had a candle in their room, they receive a little warning letter from us and that case is tracked as info only, whereas pr previously it would have been tracked as housing. And so that's why there's that stark difference from 49 last year down to one this year. Um, we've only had one case so far where somebody has had you know, a candle twice in their room or um, some other policy that housing has. In terms of recidivism, it's important for our office to help students um, learn, grow, and move forward and not have to meet with us more than once. Um, we very much enjoy getting to know students, working with students, but the hope is, is that they're not constantly meeting in our office for different policy violations. And so if you look um, at the 2020-2021 um, academic year, um, that talks about some of the recidivism numbers that we have um, for last year, um, as well as some previous years there. 
In terms of our conduct process, um, I don't wanna go too into the weeds here. I just wanna kinda high level cover it. Essentially, our office gets a report. Um, we can do a preliminary investigation if one is needed. And then we have four options. We can choose to make that case info only or have no action with it. We can choose to do conflict resolution and help resolve that difference between the two parties, um, whether that's students or um, organizations or whoever on campus. We can um, do an educational conversation, so it doesn't quite reach a policy violation, but it's almost there. And so we wanna help educate that student on uh, making better choices in the future. Or we can initiate the conduct process. Um, if we initiate the process, they have to participate in an informational meeting with our office, and then they get the choice to resolve it informally or for formally. Um, no matter what they choose, an outcome is always issued, and then again, no matter what they choose, an appeal is always um, given as an option for the student. In terms of outcomes for the conduct process, we have knowledge attainment activities, restorative activities, wellness activities, reflective activities, as well as status outcomes. And so as I've mentioned uh, before, the hope for our office is to help students learn and grow and make better choices in the future. And so that's what really those first four categories are is reflective papers, workshops, um, partnering with other offices on campus to help provide education um, and whatnot. The bottom category, um, the status outcomes, um, just kind of goes along with the process. Students do receive warning or probation. Um, that is the number one sanction um, given from our office is warning or probation. We rarely, rarely suspend, dismiss, or expel students. In terms of the academic integrity process, which our um, office kind of oversees the whole process of, um, the process is very similar. The big difference is that faculty are reporting these incidents to us um, and they will issue the outcomes with their report that is sent to us. Um, we help and guide the students through the process. We serve more as an advocate in that role um, in helping the students kind of make appropriate or the best choices for them. Um, similarly, we receive the report, they come to us for an informational meeting, they can resolve this process informally or formally, and then an outcome is issued. Um, after an outcome is issued, they always have the right to appeal, again, very similar to the conduct process. The only additional um, outcomes that come from the academic integrity process are the actual academic ones. So faculty members will assign um, letter grade reductions or course grade reductions as part of the sanctioning. In terms of our office involvement across the campus, um, we're involved in the Title IX Committee, Cleary Committee, Care Team, um, Prevention Services and Advisory Board. We serve on a variety of student affairs committees, whether that's professional development, diversity and inclusion, assessment. Um, we're really here to kind of support the division and support um, the university as a whole. Oh yeah, so the, the Cleary Committee, if you guys are not aware, um, is a group that um, writes the annual security report um, for the campus and that helps educate students on um, safety and security issues that may be happening at the university. Um, it is published by law every year by October 1st um, and is made available on University Police Department's website. So our office helps work with that group to help provide that safety and that security um, for students and for prospective students looking to come to WSU. In terms of partnerships and outreach, um, we do partner with academic affairs a lot. We are continuing to grow that partnership um, in um, the years that we have been involved with the academic integrity policy. Um, we also partner with a lot of offices um, it's in student affairs and outside student affairs, whether that's um, Gabe's office with SEAL, um, diversity and inclusion, um, you know, any, any kind of office on campus here. I'm not gonna go through each of those bullet points there. Um, we also manage the Maxient database, which helps provide support for students across the division. And so I have a slide, a couple slides later on talking more about Maxient um, and more about the offices that utilize that and um, that we help work with. In terms of assessment, um, we do have Maxient to provide end of year reports for our office. It also provides lots of data for a variety of other campus offices that use the system. Um, and it can assist in showing position needs, gaps in sanctioning, and ensuring a fair and consistent process. 
We utilize surveys as well through campus labs. Um, we recently transitioned our surveys from Qualtrics that we had been doing pre-COVID um, to campus labs and ensuring that the, the hearing process and the conduct process um, is fair for students who are interacting with it. Lastly, we did um, the CAS review and we completed that in 2021. And so really this year, we're looking at how do we document things better um, in order to show the great work that our office is doing across campus. So I touched on the annual security report um, a little earlier um, with Cleary Committee. This is just a breakdown of how kind of our office helps provide support for that Cleary report or that security report. Um, we spend a lot of time in monthly Cleary meetings, in quarterly reviewing of data, creating and formatting that report. It is fairly lengthy. Um, reviewing that report and then actually submitting it um, officially um, through the websites that we have to do that through. In terms of Maxient, like I said, we work with a variety of offices or groups on campus. Um, the first group is the Bias Incident Response Group, which is made up of um, Office of Institutional Equity and Compliance, as well as Student Affairs staff. We work with the Care Team, Disability Services, Housing and Residence Life, um, again, OIEC. Um, the Student Advocate, which is a position here in SGA. Um, our office, obviously, and then Student Health Services as well. In terms of uh, Maxient, it provides a variety of reporting systems through the report it page for those offices that we help maintain and manage um, for those variety of offices. And so there's a snapshot of some of the reports that we um, provide. And there are some other offices that use um, our, our forms and services that aren't listed on that report at page. Um, one of those offices is the Disability Services Intake Form and Continued Services Form. Um, the intent behind that is that the student is filling it out themselves. Someone is not reporting them. Um, and so that's why it doesn't appear on the report at page. We have a variety of appeal forms um, as well as interpreter request forms. In terms of responsibilities for Maxient, um, I, as well as other staff in our office, spend a lot of time in Maxient making sure that it um, supports students. So we provide a variety of trainings for staff um, and faculty here. We provide data. We, um, when needed, have to set up new offices in there. Um, so that happened with COVID as well as disability services a few years ago when they switched to a digital system. Um, we do system upkeep, webinars, trainings, and attending the Maxient Conference to be able to provide um, or, or to keep up on the trends um, and newest features. So in terms of budget, where do, you know, what does that look like? Um, where does our money go? What are we asking for? So to the best of our knowledge, SCCS became an office, a more holistic office in 2014. Um, before then, it was kind of just housed in student affairs. Um, student fee or RU money covers approximately 50% of the staff costs for our office. The remainder does come from GU, um, which is primarily tuition based um, with very little coming in state dollars. Um, there are only three sources of monies that can get funded, um, so either state money, tuition money, or student fees. And what we have done as an office to create or increase the services is um, being more active in campus community outreach, academic integrity programs, working directly with students, um, becoming way more involved in the Title IX process and partnering a lot more with OIEC, uh, Maxian oversight, and becoming more active in the university-wide um, programs and communities. Um, we support Shocker 360. We um, support Shockers After Dark and attend and, and help with that program and Back to School Bash, to name a few. So in terms of where our money goes, um, we do have salaries. Um, and so some of that is broken down there for you. We also use a lot of this money for um, just general office upkeep. So phones, copiers, IT charges, miscellaneous office supplies, um, larger purchases um, for our office, which this year or this past year, we moved offices to Shocker Hall um, and had a big office remodel there. Um, and so some of our money is going towards funding that furniture um, for those office spaces. Um, student programming sponsorship, training and recruitment expenses, um, ASCA, which is our national conference that we attend for conduct administrators. Um, so those dues um, to help us get the most accurate training needed and then other outreach efforts. 
In terms of the budget request, we are not requesting an increase in funds. We're just asking for the same amount that we've been getting the past few years. Um, we will continue to utilize reserves for added outreach efforts. Um, instead of asking for more money through student fees, we are in the process of searching for a graduate assistant this year, and funding is already in place for that graduate assistant position. Um, we are hopeful that we are gonna find someone. We've already had a couple of applications come through. And um, SCCS should continue to be fee funded because we do create that safe experience for students. We uphold the values of the WSU degree through the academic integrity process. We create educational opportunities for students to learn from their choices. And we support university-wide and divisional programs um, and initiatives that support students. So I am ready for questions. All right, so my first question is, looking at your request um, on page 16, you have $7,000 set out for scholarships. Can you speak on that? That funding is for the graduate assistant position that is in there. Um, that is the um, funding, I believe, for their tuition and fees um, that come through. Um, something you should know, I am very, very new to this director role, um, and so that's why Aaron is up here to speak. Um, and Scott is also in the back of the room as well, who has some historic knowledge of our funding. So. So just to clarify, it's not like a scholarship that you give out to students, but just for that position? Correct. Got gotcha. you. Um, advisor from second. Um, this is a good example of something I want to clear, clarify. You'll see this again with Campus Rex budget. If you can actually turn to page 16, um, you'll look at the 2020 adopted budget. Um, if you go to the bottom, it's 119,746, uh, and then their fiscal year 23 budget request is 121, and you're probably thinking, Kyle, you just told us you're not asking for an increase. Uh, that. $1,401 is their uh, benefits increase. Um, so that's being accounted into that 13,000 that you saw on the screen earlier this morning. Um, so they really, this budget is coming in flat um, at the same amount of the, of the 19, that additional, the, the Excel sheet that the departments get automatically calculate um, those increases if there are any. Um, and that's already been taken into account in that 13,000. And I'm gonna look at Lindsay to make sure that I didn't mess that up and Lindsay said I'm correct. So just FYI, as you read this and Campus Rec's budget, we'll, I'll bring that up again tomorrow so you can see that piece too. Any other questions? Uh, Speaker Tubach. Yeah, uh, this might be more of a question directed for our university folks, but uh, uh, on page 13, item two, uh, in, in additional revenue, it says 42,300 from general use funds. I was just wondering uh, what that process is for determining that amount or um, you know, how we come to that 42,000. That's, that's the salary aspect that is taken care of through the GU portion. As Kyle mentioned that their funds come in through both GU and RU funds. And so that's the part of the GU that goes towards salary and benefits. Dr. Hall. Actually, um, Jacob, that's a good question. That earlier I was I was talking to someone else about there are different sources of funds. So GU is a is a considered more of a state. It comes from SGF funding and it comes from tuition and other revenues, right? Two sources. Two sources. And then um, then RU is what we're talking about here. Those are student fees. And then we have departments like housing, for example, that their budgets are based on the revenue that they collect from from housing dollars. And so each of the, the departments in student affairs are a mix of different types of, of funding. Some are more um, just GU, and then others like um, SEAL, for example, they're completely RU funded. And so there are just, money comes from different directions, different things, so, it's, so that was a good question. Any other questions for the speakers? Representative Ramey. Uh, for you guys, what was the benefit from switching your survey software from Qualtrics to Campus Labs? Um, we were utilizing Qualtrics um, pre-COVID and even during COVID a little bit. Um, and then through the assessment committee that I serve on, um, we, through Student Affairs, had gotten Campus Labs. And the benefit really there is the, the data opportunities through Campus Labs. Um, with Qualtrics, it's great to have a survey and send that survey out. But beyond that, it wasn't tied to the university um, uh, 
um, feed of information. So I couldn't tell how many students were um, of certain ethnicities or certain genders when they filled that out. Whereas with Campus Labs, we can input some more of that information. Um, and so that's definitely a huge benefit for using Campus Labs. We obviously also get that information through Maxient as well, um, but the questions that we're asking through Campus Labs is vastly different from the information we get in Maxient. Dr. Hall? So, um, we, um, I'm sorry, John. We, we went to Campus Labs because it's the same company that, sh that owns Shocker Sank. And so we wanted some synergy between the data we, we have through um, organizational management that then we could then use our assessment data and it can actually, we can go in and make some, do some data polls based on students involved in student organizations and some of those kind of things. And so that's why we went with that package versus Qualtrics. Any other questions, Speaker Tubok? Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on the survey questions, I was wondering, uh, you, uh, on page 15, section nine, uh, it says we've assessed our conduct and academic integrity process using student surveys. I was just curious about uh, the kind of changes that were made as a result of those or considered, um, if you could explain that. Yeah, so in that survey that we're using through Campus Labs, um, to be fully transparent, when we used it on Qualtrics, um, the, the changes were really in the process of how we, how we handled things, making sure that the process flowed easily for students, making sure that students understood the process even before meeting with us. Um, and so that's where some of those changes went through kind of during that COVID time. Um, during that time, it was a lot harder to use those surveys and a lot harder to assess that process. And so that's why we kind of backed off and then transitioned to Campus Labs, like I said, this year, because it made the most sense. Um, we're hoping that in the future, those surveys will continue to help us assess um, the fairness of our process, um, whether students are understanding their rights and responsibilities, whether they're understanding the process as a whole. And then we also do a sanctioning survey um, as well at the very end of the process. The hardest part with that sanctioning survey is getting students to fill it out um, because we send it in the case close letter and so it's, it's there and it says, please fill this out, but it's on the student to actually click on that link and fill it out. Um, the earlier surveys where I talked about fairness of the process, we give those immediately following that informational meeting. And so um, the students aren't allowed to leave our office until they fill it out. Um, we do step outside of our office. They don't have to fill it out right in front of us. Um, and so th that's the intent kind of behind the survey there. I would also add that the, uh, the office is also consistently or kind of constantly evaluating their process. Uh, we're in the process right now. Uh, Kyle has been doing a lot of work working with the academic integrity, kind of the flow of that process based off of the feedback we've received from students, based off the feedback we've received from faculty to try to make sure that that process is uh, aligned with what everyone needs and so we can make it as, as smooth as possible. So even though we're doing these surveys to gather information, we're also consistently evaluating and looking at things as well. Um, as Dr. Hall mentioned, we've, we've brought this new Campus Labs data point in so that we can kind of connect all these other dots so, so that uh, the survey we do through this office will continue to be, be richer and more robust as we have more data points to utilize and kind of how we can apply that in different places. Any other questions for the speakers? Uh, Representative Kirk? Yeah, and on page 15, section 11, it says um, that you strongly believe that the student conduct and community standards is valued throughout the rest of the campus. Um, one thing that has been mentioned in previous years as well that um, you don't want to be, it's, it's hard to be only seen as the bad guy. Um, so going through this, um, through this previous year and going further, um, do you believe that you have uh, reached that goal and what are some uh, continuing plans to be able to uh, show yourself to the rest of the student body and not being as seen as that? I think when you have an office base that's, that's confronting student behavior, it is always gonna be viewed as the bad guy. Um, it's, just, it's just a natural part of it. Um, and so, we, and we understand it. And I think Kyle and Liz and folks who have come through that office understand that. And that's why we try to, when students enter the process, we try to make it as friendly 
as it can be, that we don't want it to be scary. We understand students are already freaked out because they're in this process. So we try to help them navigate through it and make sure that they're not freaked out through the entire thing. But, we are, but the responsibility is to hold students accountable for behavior that doesn't coincide with our expectations. So people are always gonna have somewhat of a, a negative view on that because you're holding people accountable. At the same time, it is a rather simplistic view to think, well, you, all you do is bust students for when they're in trouble. I mean, if you've paid attention, Kyle has mentioned multiple times about education, and that's what we're trying to do is educate students in the exact same way. We're educating on behavior so that students will make safer, smarter decisions as they move forward. And hopefully, and as you see by the recidivism rates, that we're getting students, hopefully, that they're making smarter decisions and safer decisions, and so they're not coming back in through the office. Um, and at the same time, when we are holding and having these conversations, it is to increase the safety for those around them, because oftentimes the behavior that students are involving in, it's not just for themselves. And if it is, we have those conversations. Um, Kyle and Liz, they do a, a number of recommendations to the care team and to CAPS based off the conversations that they have with students. But often, it's students who, are, who have behaviors that also affect those around them. And so we're working not only to help that student, but also to help that community around by an educational process. But all that being said, it's real pretty, but it's, it's, we're always gonna be seen as the bad guy because that's just kind of the nature of how the office is always gonna be viewed. Um, Kyle is out, Liz is out, and they're, you know, like he mentioned, being involved in Shockers After Dark, and you know, you see Kyle, and he's usually there with video games because that's his get down. So students can have those conversations with him and see him outside of that, that environment. And so we do what we can to try to break down those walls and break down those barriers so that students see the office as more than that. But there's just kind of an inherent part of it that's always gonna be seen as a little bit negative. But the hope is that through the work that we're doing and through you know, the work that we share with all of you, you can see that that is not all we do and, that ha and that's why this is a valuable part of the university's function. Representative Rongish. Yeah, just to piggyback off what you were saying about um, taking educational approaches, um, is most of what you guys do reactive, like after an incident happens, or do you guys do a lot of stuff uh, proactively to like, I suppose, keep people from ending up in your office in the first place? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. So we are, um, admittedly, we are very reactive. However, we do very, um, a lot of proactive measures. And so those proactive measures can be seen through um, the Title IX Committee and the work that we do with OIEC, um, bringing speakers to campus in previous years to be able to speak on um, those types of concerns, working with deans and faculty in um, academic affairs um, to promote academic integrity. Um, we're hoping to do a little more of that in the coming year, especially given the large uptick of academic integrity cases we've seen, um, whether that's some sort of social media campaign or some sort of um, poster campaign in, in some of the academic buildings. Um, you know, we do try to be as proactive as we can um, with our process, but unfortunately the fact of the matter is, is that some of it has to be reactive. Some of it we can't plan for. Um, I know this year one of the big changes post-COVID um, is the types of cases that we're seeing. Um, previously, we've seen a lot more al uh, alcohol, a lot more um, drug violations. Um, this year, we've seen a lot more um, disruptive behavior issues. And so I don't think our office could have ever predicted that moving forward from COVID. Um, but now that we know that that's kind of a bigger issue, how do we get in the residence halls and have um, uh, conversations with residents about roommate conflicts and roommate mediations and things of that nature. I would also add that, you know, that the office is involved in orientations, so there is an opportunity to present information as students are coming in. Granted, right, that's a fire hose kind of moment, like everybody's taking in a lot of information, but hopefully there's some of that that sticks in addition to recognizing that the office is there and who it is and hopefully making a connection with maybe some of the people. Uh, the hope would be, right, as we continue uh, that we can do more of that. That's one of the things that a grad can help with. So being able to kind of help offset some of that workload so that people can, whether that's Kyle or Liz or the grad, to go and do some other presentations to be a little bit more proactive and be in spaces where it might be necessary. I guess to add on to that, thank you. Um, the orientation is a big piece. We also do presentations for um, a variety of GTAs across campus um, by faculty who ask us to come out and do that. Um, we can't hit every GTA ever on campus as there's quite a few, um, but we do do a variety of presentations for that as well. 
have time for one more question. Uh, speaker Tubot. Yeah, so being a, a student fees funded, primarily student fees funded uh, office, I was wondering, you know, wh what kind of influence does student input have on policy and how is new policy adopted? And in terms of kind of, sorry, this is kind of a three questions in one, but uh, in terms of uh, academic integrity process, how is the faculty involved in that and how are students kind of balanced out in that respect? Great question. So I'll address the academic integrity process first because that is different than the code of conduct process. With academic integrity, that policy and procedure is fully owned by um, others outside of our office in academic affairs. Our office really is in charge of um, taking students through that process and we can recommend changes, but those changes have to be fully approved by faculty senate. Um, and so faculty have a large role in that process and in that policy. Um, beyond faculty in there though, we have a variety of students that serve on the Student Academic Integrity Committee that we have, um, and those students um, always are giving feedback and, and thoughts about the policy and the process, and we solicit that feedback from them as well, um, especially when we're looking at making those changes to that, that policy and, and recommending those changes. In terms of the code of conduct, um, something that Liz and I have talked about this year um, is really trying to get more student input and student voice in, the, um, in revamping that policy or procedure when it's needed. Um, it's not to say that we don't ask students now, <laughs> we do. We have students who serve on the student conduct board um, as well as those students that serve on the academic integrity committee. But I would like to see something a little more formal. Um, I know at a previous institution I worked at, um, there was a group called the Golden Rule Committee and that was made up of entirely students and they sat down and reviewed the code of conduct there made changes as they, or made recommendations to changes um, as they saw fit. Um, and they had a lot of student input and voice into that. And so that's something that we're looking at doing. Um, it won't happen overnight, but it is something we're definitely looking at doing. Can I, I, can I clarify one thing real quick? I mentioned earlier that some of the things that Kyle has been doing that we're looking to make those changes to the academic integrity policy. And primarily, I, I misspoke, those are much more procedural as opposed to policy changes. So they're flow more, more things and so they won't have, the hope would be that students really wouldn't recognize any change in that other than it's more user friendly for them. So it's not a policy change, it's more of a procedure change. So I just wanted to clarify that. All right, thank you all for your time and your presentation. I would also add uh, for the committee, if there are questions that you didn't get to ask, um, feel free to send them to me and I will send them to um, the presenters or presenters um, and get those back to you. And our next group is ready, so Madam Clerk, you can proceed.
now our next presenters are ready, so Madam Clerk, you can proceed. Mr. Chairman, presentation number three is WSU Varsity Esports. Their request is located on page 17 of the fees binder. Thank you for that. Thank you for uh, coming here to present your uh, budget to us. You have 15 minutes uh, to present any line items or any necessary information you think the committee needs, as well as 15 minutes afterwards for us as a committee to ask you questions. So we'll just start off with some introductions. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and chair of the student fees committee. Good afternoon. My name is Camila Gums and I'm the student body vice president. My name is Letitia Murdoch and I'm representing the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. My name is John Kirk. I am the budget and finance chair for the student senate. My name is Jacqueline Villa and I represent grad school. My name is Nathan Rongish. I'm representing the College of Fine Arts. Tegan Altenberg, I'm representing the College of Health Professions. Sheila Surrender, Financial Aid and Scholarships. Terry Hall, Vice President for Student Affairs. Gabriel Fonseca, I'm the SGA Advisor. Lindsay Pletcher, University Budget Office. David Miller, University. Jason Post with the Budget Office. I'm John Ramey and I'm representing the Barton School of Business. My name is Gladys Heitzman and I'm representing the Honors College. My name is Jacob Tubach, and I'm the Speaker of the Student Senate. Annalisa Bridge, Clerk of the Student Senate. And with that, you all have the floor. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first time having the honor of speaking on behalf of esports here um, in a setting like this. So uh, hopefully I can give you guys a good picture of kind of the initiatives that we're trying to accomplish here um, and looking forward to answering uh, any questions that you all may have at the end. Um, just to start, my name is Travis Yang. I'm the director of esports here for Wichita State. Um, just started here this past December, um, moving up here from San Antonio, but I am a native of Wichita, so it's really cool for me to be back here on campus. Um, jumping into it, kind of the, the program as a whole uh, with Varsity Esports has been um, in a period of transition. Right now we are in the process of transferring to the uh, College of Applied Studies. Prior to this, esports was housed within um, recreation. Um, so I figured, and I'll let uh, Joe introduce himself, but um, Joe has kind of been holding down the fort. Um, you know, he's been a student, he's been an interim director now twice. Um, so I figured, you know, I, I, it'd be best for Joe to kind of speak on his experiences in the time here leading up to where we're at right now. Um, he's definitely been on the ground doing work. Um, so I wanted to give him an opportunity to, to speak quickly. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Mazzara. Uh, I've been working with esports on campus since uh, 2017. Uh, I served as the president of the student club for two years, and I've been working with the esports program since 2019 when it was founded. I just wanted to give a little bit of perspective on the growth that the program's seen uh, and growth in esports across all of campus uh, since I've been here. Um, I helped to found esports in kind of its current iteration, uh, both at the varsity and club level. Um, when I became the president of a club, we had about 20 active members, uh, and by the end of my tenure, we had about 145 active members, and the varsity program is seeing pretty similar growth in terms of uh, linear to upward trajectory. Uh, we started the program with two teams in our first semester in 2019, and we currently have five teams as well as over 10 plus student auxiliary staff to help us with content and social media, um, as well as We've housed three total interns on a, uh, from an applied learning perspective, of one of which is standing in the back of the room, Avery, Avery who is our social media manager. Um, but as we've seen this growth occur, um, obviously the need for um, a recurring and stable source of finance has become uh, the kind of the forefront of both our proposal and uh, our general financial uh, need. Um, and I'll give it back to Travis to talk a little bit more about that. No, thank you very much, Joe. Um, you know, kind of the, the way I've been approaching this and as I've been learning about, um, the, you know, the, the funding breakdown, um, I think it's a, a, it's a good marriage, right? Because right now we have support from a couple different divisions across campus, student affairs, academic affairs, support from within this college, applied studies. Um, and in my mind, it, it really makes sense, right? Given the vision of the university and kind of what we see 
uh, esports trying to accomplish, right? Esports reaches, has a unique opportunity to reach across so many different areas, academically, competitively, um, student involvement, reaching out to the community. So it's, in my mind, it's almost logical, right, that we want support across divisions from students, from academic departments, from all of these various divisions, and hopefully increase support from, you know, more colleges as well going forward. I'm going to skip past this initial funding breakdown section, but feel free to take a look. I think that's something will be a good reference, especially when we get to the, the Q&A portion. But that does provide a, a more detailed breakdown, um, kind of as, as the, our funding is right now, that may not be reflected in that um, actual budget sheet that you all have in front of you. Jumping into the uh, personnel section, um, I'd actually like to, to call upon Dr. Stahl. Just, um, you know, obviously my position right now, um, it existed before, but it's under, undergone a, a major kind of revamp. And I think that's in line with a, an updated vision that the institution has had, has created for esports. Um, and Dr. Stahl can maybe speak a little bit on um, kind of how that came about and where we're at right now. Thank you, Travis. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Clay Stolt. I'm the interim dean in the College of Applied Studies, and uh, we've been uh, very involved with the esports program here at WSU since its launch. Um, over the last year, as uh, we as an institution have assessed where we are with our esports program and our varsity program in particular, uh, we've made some big decisions in terms of how we think we need to best position that program for success and maximum impact going forward. Um, one of the things that uh, was a part of that was the decision to uh, house the program within our college. Does not mean that esports is the exclusive domain of CAS. It simply means that um, we, have some, we have some strengths in terms of resources that we can bring to the program that we think uh, can really add value and, again, best position it for maximum impact. Um, also, as part of those uh, major decisions, as you've seen with the proposal that you've received today, um, the university has invested in the varsity esports program at a, at a significant level. Uh, I realize SGA has been uh, very supportive and certainly we're appreciative of the, the uh, funds, the fees that have come through this body um, in the past and they've done a great job of establishing our program as being an important element of our campus and nationally relevant as well. If we're going to really get where we want to go overall and that includes everything from competitive success to having um, uh, effective relationships and outreach programs with our community and engagement with our student body, we know we need to invest at a higher level. And so that's been the purpose of those two things coming together. Um, I will just close by saying that uh, while this is a little bit different in terms of the housing of the program, uh, we continue to work very closely with Dr. Hall and Student Affairs and with Interim Provost Lefevre and Academic Affairs uh, we also confer uh, regularly with John Lee and Campus Recreation. So those relationships are, are existing and ongoing and positive, and we think that by working together, we're going to be able to get to where we want to go. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Dr. Stahl. Um, I won't go too much into details of the positions. Obviously, it's in front of you here, but um, you know, as Dr. Stahl touched upon with the director position, um, that's all a huge revamp and increase in that base salary there. Um, ultimately, in terms of the funding that comes from student service fees, um, that's a 5% increase into that position that was previously budgeted. Um, the creation of an eSports graduate staff assistant, that's something that uh, I've made a huge push for. Uh, I've been very fortunate enough to be a part of some programs in the past, eSports programs. Um, where they've been able to help fund an esports graduate assistant or a position like that. And I found that that's great for the development of the students who are, who are able to take advantage of that. Um, following up on that, student employment. Um, that's one of the first things that I saw and one thing that um, I thought was amazing coming here. Um, again, referencing, we have two students there in the back, Avery and Jared. They've been volunteering their time as operations coordinators and you know, communications coordinators. Um, we have lots of students who are in those roles. They're, they're very passionate about esports and gaming, not even necessarily on the competitive end, but you know, they just want to help support the program. They want to get that experience. I think it's only right 
for our program to try and create these paid positions, rightfully, uh, to reward them for the work that they've been doing. Um, and, and again, so it's creations of communications coordinator and operations coordinator there. Um, finally, in, in regards to personnel, in my experience, this is in line uh, with other esports programs that we see kind of at the D1 level. Um, every year there's more and more, uh, but in the research and comparisons that we've done, we've looked at schools like Boise State, University of Missouri, Illinois State, uh, University of North Texas, uh, schools that are in comparable positions that have varsity programs that have been around. Uh, I know we're heading into, we're kind of in the middle of our third year here with varsity esports. Um, so I feel it's, it's kind of we're in the right place to, to make a move like this. Uh, moving into our program initiatives, um, this is kind of going in, into more detail um, as to what you know, we envision using this funding for from student services fees. Uh, a lot of these things uh, we've had kind of in the ideation phase, but haven't necessarily been able to execute on. Um, obviously, I don't want to use the pandemic as an excuse, but you know, when it comes to things like travel or community engagement, um, there have been major barriers there. But we are planning right for the future. So uh, when it comes to travel, for example, and we're already starting to see events specific to esports in the collegiate space start to sprout up again, even here in Kansas. Um, we've seen local businesses partner that work in the space, partner of universities um, in Kansas and Missouri and Nebraska, and these are all events that reasonably I'd like to, to plan for and take our students to and give them the opportunity to travel and compete. In regards to scholarships, um, this is one area that I think me personally, I'm super excited about, and I'm sure Joe is as well. Um, number one, it allows us to better serve our students. There's lots of students always, right, in financial need that could use that aid. Um, so that is our number one priority. Additionally, right, the nature of esports, it, it is similar to a traditional sports program. Having scholarship available um, does kind of align us with more of a, a traditional recruiting cycle, right? We're actually able to go out to high schoolers within Kansas or out of state and you know, potentially provide scholarship to help you know, bring them here to which the state, to our program. Student body engagement, uh, this is something, again, I've been fortunate to have some experience with. Um, when I was in, in San Antonio, uh, our esports program was actually housed within the rec sports department, similar to what it was here previously. Um, but what that means is that when you're housed under rec or, or um, you know, the nature of esports is that you can engage students in a lot more areas than just competition, right? I think a lot of people when they hear esports, right? It's in the name, sports, it's com competitive. But if all you're thinking about when you're looking at esports is competition, you're missing 90% of esports. Esports, in my mind, is a way to engage with students who are interested in gaming, who are interested in competition, who are interested in all of the uh, supplemental areas, right? Auxiliary positions, like people who are interested in broadcasting and, and interested in marketing, and graphic design, and team management, all of these areas. Um, that's the areas that we want to engage with more. So we want to create programming and opportunity specific to those areas, again, outside of competition um, to help reach those students, right? whether they be here currently on campus or, again, at the high school level. And finally, I think that ties into reach, right? Um, one goal of our program that we've been trying to do and, and will for the foreseeable future is increase our reach, increase our presence, our connections, relationships with middle schools, high schools, within Kansas, outside of Kansas, within our region. Uh, we've been fortunate enough already. Uh, we've met with USD 259 as well as some of the local high schools. Um, for those of you who don't know, USD 259 has actually adopted varsity esports at a district level. So I believe right now every single high school in which that's part of USD 259 already has an esports PC lab on their campus. And that's a direct tie-in of our program. So there's already plenty of ways they're hosting events. We have our facility here to interact, help those students out, even have our students go out and help mentor those students at their programs and just kind of build that relationship um, you know, over, over the next few years. Um, so in the interest of time, so we can have time for questions. Yeah. Um, sorry to cut you off, but we're gonna stop right there. Um, are there any questions for the presenters? Uh, Representative Rungish. Yeah, so you mentioned um, stuff about when it comes to recruiting and scholarships being traditional, you want it to be more like traditional sports, um, being able to go to high schools, get people to come join the program. And 
I was thinking about how, so for example, like the basketball team has a lot of like ticket sales and like it's relatively almost self-sustaining in terms of like revenue. Is there, I want you to be able to advocate for yourself on the importance of like having money for scholarships to, to bring students in because is, do you guys have uh, revenue to like help, s are you guys more self-sustaining in that way? I, I'm, I don't know much about esports and like if you guys um, have like revenue to give out scholarships and bring uh, great kids into the program and that helps create more revenue and sustain yourself like that. Sure, no, I, I think that's a great question. I think the reality of the, the space right now, especially with esports being as new as it is, and especially even the collegiate scene, um, some of those traditional means of revenue, right, often that we see in the traditional sports world, they don't quite exist in esports. Obviously, we're putting in the groundwork right now to create those avenues, things like apparel, right, things like uh, camps, uh, fundraising through live broadcasts, those means there's are definitely initiatives that are in the works right now, um, but realistically they're not anywhere near a point where it's self-sustaining. Um, in regards to scholarship, again, um, it does. I, I'd say it is one goal, right, to emulate the model that's existing in traditional sports, right, where you bring in students, and number one that helps the institution. But the number one goal in my mind is not from a recruitment standpoint; it's from helping students through financial aid, students who genuinely need that support. Um, and that are ideally also a match for our program so that we can, we can make that work. Um, I will say one, uh, one thing real quickly, one initiative that we're working on right now, and CAS has, has kind of been the, um, the leader in this right now, um, we would ideally like to work with colleges and deans from those colleges specifically so that you know, perhaps they can provide some amount of scholarship to help supplement our pool, and then in return, we can guarantee that, hey, we're going to go and, and recruit students and students who are going into your college or who are already in that college will be then awarded that scholarship that you've allocated towards us. So it's a win-win for both sides. Um, so I have a few questions. First is looking at your um, request number three, talks about your increase and how um, part of it is for the expected return to travel events. Um, have you all been given the green light to travel or is that something you're still waiting on? Uh, we we do have a green light to travel. Um, now, again, the funding to support that um, in terms of moving to the level that we want to, there's going to be a little bit of a phase in, but yes. Any other questions? I do have another question. Um, so with you being now housed in Applied Studies, um, is there any like fee or anything you pay to use the eSports hub or is that still free for you all? To my understanding, there is no fee currently associated and no students pay a, an additional fee to use that space. Any other questions? Representative Rongish? Yeah, so I know that eSports is kind of like booming in terms of growth because it's a very very recent thing and i want to know what if you guys have any thoughts on like where you guys want to be in the next down the line in, in a few years because i suppose right now it's so early that this conversation is more a conversation of investment like we give you money and then um to see you know w how you guys can grow I, I i wanted to give you guys a chance to advocate for yourself on uh, on your future investment. Sure, I'll speak a little bit, and I imagine Joe would probably also have some thoughts on that as well. Um, you know, looking at growth in the immediate term to, you know, five years, um, my vision is truly for which the state to be a leader in the space. That's plain and simple. Um, the beautiful, beautiful thing about esports right now, especially in the collegiate space, is there's not one program out there or one model that just does it right. The beauty of it is we can look at other programs as we often do and see like, hey, we like that, or we like that initiative that they did. We like, we like that community outreach thing that that school did. And if we like it, then we can you know, take that back here and see, okay, hey, how can we make that work here in Wichita? Um, 
I want a program that really touches all areas. I think I've already touched upon it a little bit, but competition is just a slice of, of esports, right? Our ability to reach out to high schoolers, to students who never once in their life thought that they could actually game in college and represent their university, but also have the stability and a family and a structure to help support them in that, that's what I want to provide. Um, I often think back to the time when you know, I was a student, I went to University of Missouri. Um, they didn't have varsity esports, and as a freshman, as you all are probably familiar, time management skills are not good. Um, and <laughs> my grades suffered greatly for that. Um, but now since I've been in a position where I've been able to, to create that structure and family for students coming in, I've seen the impact it's had. I've had students who, you know, they've, they've gotten admitted as conditional admits, but because we help keep them on track and we hold them, you know, to those academic standards, after a semester, after a year, they're off, you know, the, the conditional status and they're doing just fine and they're enjoying themselves. Um, so it really is kind of a holistic thing. It's not just competition. Any other questions, Representative Ramey? So uh, just looking at your guys' story, um, with over stu 30 students working towards the advancement of the programs, is that 30 students that are like working with esports or are those varsity players? Um, so that would include, um, and that's, that's kind of an estimate, um, that would include all of our team managers, um, any team staff that are assisting managers, our entire content department, which is at least 15, I believe. Um, so yes, it's students that are not players that are working with the program. How many players do you guys have right now? Um, so currently we have about 30 as well. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'd say reasonably about 30 active students that we would consider varsity student athletes for esports. And on top of that, about 15 between the support staff that we have as well as our content staff, right? Those are students who do broadcasting, who do game day uh, coverage for us, et cetera. So I guess my question for you guys would be then with like having 10 staff members and then about 30 varsity players, and then with kind of like the opportunities you guys provide in the middle, which definitely seem kind of like the mission of why you're here today. Um, what would you like that, like those, like I, I, the, assuming the staff members are full-time just for the sake of this, what would you like the ratio of your players to staff to look like in three years from now? Would you like to have it where you have a staff member for about every three players or would you like that to change? I was actually just about to say maybe a one to three ratio, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, for better or for worse, <laughs> there's not a model right now. There's not, it's not like a traditional basketball program where you can see, hey, I have a, a head coach, an assistant coach, and a GA, and X amount of staff. None of that has really been figured out right now. So, but that's where we can come in you know, and lead the industry, lead the space in that regard. We can figure out a way that works and hopefully do it in a sustainable way. And if it works really well, then other schools will look at us and be like, hey, we really like the way which the state does it. Let's do it that way. Any other questions for the speakers? Speaker Tubok? Yeah, so I was just looking at the funding breakdown and obviously you guys get kind of, like you said, money from everywhere kind of on campus. Uh, did, I was just wondering if you guys uh, have any funding from the athletics department itself. To my understanding right now, we have no funding from athletics. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Kistol, I don't believe we've ever received any funding from athletics. Yes, that's correct. And um, the program administration, it's a completely separate housing for eSports. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Rungish. So I was reading um, the, the paper and uh, in terms of technology, I understand you guys have to like buy new computers every so often. And I suppose if the growth continues at the rate that it has, you just, in terms of numbers, you'll need more stuff. Um, and so I guess my question is more about um, when it comes to like a program that's that's growing so fast, or sorry, not program, but uh, like esports is growing so fast in general. How I want to know your thoughts on the sustainability of buying new technology. Do you have to do it every year? Like, do, would you guys need the 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 sharpest, top of the line computers, the fastest computers every year? Um, because just monetarily, that's obviously you know exp expensive to buy new um, equipment and you know to to keep a program having the 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 best equipment possible 
you know, you want the 2022 computers that were just released. I, I want to know your thoughts on that. Sure. So um, obviously kind of the most, the time when costs are most incurred is at the start when you're trying to just get the PCs to start. And of course, when you're purchasing new PCs, you'd want the newest ones. You know, the PCs in our facilities right now are about two to three years old. Um, the good thing about esports, and not to get too technical about it, but the games that we play, 99% of the time, they are designed actually to operate as well as possible on the lowest possible specifications, specifically to address um, competitive integrity so that people who have better computers don't necessarily have an advantage. Um, so in that regard, it actually helps us tremendously. Um, so obviously when we purchase computers, we want to get you know, the best on the market for the price, um, but we expect those computers to last five, six years. And then we're actually working on coming up with a kind of a replacement program where we cycle out a certain amount of computers and purchase a certain amount every year, but we're never trying to you know, revamp the whole lineup of computers every year. Because like you touched upon, that would be unreasonable. Um, Vice President Gums. Um, so my, my question for you guys is, um, so this is really a substantial investment for us from Student Peace to be putting into this program, especially since it's new and all the techno techno mm, sorry, <laughs> technological aspects to it and everything in regards of esports. So can you really share with us how and why do you think this should be an investment from the students through student fees and not an investment from the university itself? In my mind, again, as I referenced briefly at the start, it, it makes sense to me because we directly impact the students, right? Um, I wasn't able to go too much into detail, but in that breakdown, uh, when we look at the way we expect to budget and use the student fees, should we receive those? the majority are going to the creation of those applied learning positions, right? The, the operations coordinator um, and the communications coordinator. So that's going right back as an investment into our students. Um, the programming that we do and that we want to continue building out, the outreach, we want to create programming that you know, hits all students that are interested in gaming. Again, not just competitive. Obviously, we have to start somewhere and that's kind of where Varsity Esports is as the foundation of that program, but that's only the start. Right, we want to be able to reach out, like I said, to these high schoolers, to students on campus, the middle schoolers. We've already had some, some classes visit, and we've already gotten interest from communities and students from around the state. You know, They just started their club, and now they want to visit. So um, yeah, to, to bring it back to your question, I, it makes sense in my mind because we're offering something straight back to the students directly. I have time for one more question. Speaker Tubak. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask about the changes to the director position uh, that resulted in the 62% the increase. Uh, do you think you could talk about uh, why that decision was made and, and kind of what um, changes were made to that position to, to um, validate that increase? I'll go ahead and, and pass that to Dr. Stolp. Yeah, great question. Thank you. So um, our previous eSports director uh, left the position to pursue another opportunity, entirely her decision. She did some great work. We, we really appreciate everything that she did. Um, at the time of that transition, though, it coincided with the conversations that we were having at a university level in terms of where we want to see eSports go and uh, what type of impact we really wanted to have. And at that time, uh, what we determined was that we, we really needed someone in a directorship position that had significant experience within the field, that had established themselves as a leader within the collegiate esports space. And so to attract someone such as Travis with those types of qualifications, uh, the salary had to be at a commensurate level. And so um, we, we conducted a search and, and had a tremendous pool of candidates. Um, Travis emerged from that, and uh, he is, he's already done incredible work during his short time with us. And just to echo on um, Dr. Stahl, uh, again, in my personal experience, kind of just being in the scene, being in the environment, um, it has been a trend the past year or two years, uh, spe specifically for institutions at this level, at a D1 level, that are getting in esports. Um, this salary increase actually kind of kind of brings us up in line with the current industry uh, standards. All right, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and your time. Thank you.
Holy Spirit come in my life. All right, Madam Clerk, our next presenters are ready, so you may begin. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, presentation number four is Shift Space Gallery. Their request is located on page 25 of the fees binder. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming to present to us. Uh, you have 15 minutes to present on any uh, information that you think is necessary for the committee to know. After that, um, 15 minutes will be set aside for us to ask you questions about your presentation or your budget. Uh, we'll start off with some quick introductions. My name is Zachary James. I'm the student body treasurer and chair of the student fees committee. Good afternoon, I'm Camila Gums and I'm the student body vice president. My name is Letitia Murdoch and I represent the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. My name is John Kirk and I am the budget and finance chair for the student senate. My name is Jacqueline Villa, and I represent the Graduate School. My name is Nathan Rongish. I'm representing the College of Fine Arts. Tegan Altenberg, I'm representing the College of Health Professions. I'm Sheilu Surrender, Executive Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships. Gabriel Fonseca, I'm the SGA Advisor. Lindsay Pletcher, University Budget Office. Hi, David Miller from the University Budget Office. Hello, Jason Post with the Budget Office. John Ramey representing the Barton School of Business. Gladys Heitzman representing the Honors College. I'm Jacob Tubach, I'm the Speaker of the Student Senate. Annalisa Bridge, Clerk of the Student Senate. And with that, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about Shift Space. I'm Kristen Beal, I am the Gallery Manager. And with me here today, I have Olivia Lane and Zoe Hayes. These are two of my shift space employees. Um, so this shift space student group was awarded the 2020 Outstanding Small Organization of the Year Award by Student Involvement. And of course, this was right as COVID was ramping up. And I think if anything, our presentation will show that we've really tried to um, pivot. <laughs> I know we're all really sick of that word, but that is um, an accurate word. Sometimes pivoting so much that we feel dizzy in doing it. <clears throat> um, I've listed here um, all of the exhibitions and things that have happened at Shift Space since I was here last year. Um, and last year, March of 2021, is when we did the Everybody Eats period show uh, with Lydia, Lydia Humphreys. Um, Lydia is our um, president of the student group. She is actually installing her thesis exhibition at Shift Space right now, and that is why she is not here. I told her she didn't need to be here. So I really try to create Shift Space as a um, professional incubator for students that want to utilize our network and our space and our programming for their own professional development. <clears throat> And I'm just gonna quickly kind of run through some of the things we've done in the last year. So as I said, in March 2021, we partnered with the ICT Community Fridge Project to bring, food in, uh, bring attention to food insecurity in Wichita. Um, Lydia built this giant fridge and we collected shelf-stable foods from the fridge. <clears throat> um, these are some installation shots of that night. Then in June, we partnered with Envision Arts. <clears throat> um, Dale Small is an alum of Wichita State and was doing some programming with Envision. Envision is a nonprofit organization that serves um, low site individuals and they put on an exhibition in our space and now have um, opened up their own gallery downtown, which is really great. 
Then in July, we had this Lima to Wichita intercultural dialogues and clothing and paint. This was, um, we had, there was a visiting artist from Peru that was here that worked with students for this exhibition. And then in September, we did Please Let Me See Your Face. This was for incoming graduate students, um, all new to Wichita. So it was a great way to introduce these students to the local arts community. And then we partnered with ODI to do this Bullhorn Press zine and typography exhibition and workshop. We partnered with ODI for the workshop. This workshop actually was canceled and had to be rescheduled. If you remember, there was a water main break or something like that that happened at the last minute. But they did go ahead and do the workshop. Then in November, we had this ink weaving exhibition, which is a blackout poetry exhibition. And it was actually designed and implemented by uh, Olivia Lane here. And then back up a little bit, um, Shift Space partnered with ODI this past summer to help with the Juneteenth parade. So Shift Space employees develop creative workshops for area schools and day camps to help them participate in the parade. Here's pictures of the Boys and Girls Club camp students working on their parade entries. Um, I, we won a grant, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, that allowed me to hire three graduate students for this summer that helped us participate in the parade <clears throat> for Juneteenth. They built this float for the Miss Juneteenth pageant. <clears throat> And then for the grant, we won a grant to bring a visiting artist to campus to help us develop a new tradition around homecoming. So we brought George Ferrandi. And we already had those amazing sunflowers from the Juneteenth float. And so we developed basically like templates for the sunflowers and we partnered with Go Create and pre-cut all the sunflower partners there and then we partnered with the Office of Engagement, um, the ADSI, we also went to Comfort Care Homes and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to connect us to different communities to do these sunflower making workshops. Uh, workshop participants were asked to make one flower for themselves or their favorite shocker and one for us to add to our homecoming parade garland. Uh, here we are with a resident of the Comfort Care Homes and I can't remember this day school. It's near campus here, but Nikayla Pack um, set this up and, and took us in there. Uh, we were in the sundown parade with our sunflowers and the dance team. And um, this is actually my beautiful daughter and grandson in front of the sunflower, so I couldn't help but <laughs> put that in here. <laughs> and then we worked with the visiting artist to make a giant puppet for the parade. So here you see the puppet kind of in the making. And then on parade day, there it is. The puppet um, actually sat on a, like a backpack so it could go up really high in the air and had basically three handlers. It had the person that was holding it and then a person for each um, arm. And here's some more parade day photos. We utilized those giant sunflowers again and put them on um, people's backs like backpacks and the giant garland that everybody had contributed to. OK. <laughs> and all of this to try to establish a new homecoming tradition for Wichita State. Oh, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> I think that's good. I think, oh yeah, okay. We also um, made this cart, golf cart topper for President Muma. We made a replica of Morrison Hall for his golf cart, which is super fun. <clears throat> Another parade entry. 
And we have stored all this stuff away and plan to bring it back out again this year. And actually, I um, met with Go Create, and they asked if they could be involved, you know, in any way, and may want to kind of house the Sunflower Project there, so that as students come in and learn to use the, um, I think it's the laser machine, the machine that cut all those sunflowers out, they will just utilize the that file to cut that stuff out, and then they plan to um, be doing workshops in the residence halls and stuff like that. So it would just be a way to help us kind of get it deeper into the campus. I want to say that the Shift Space team has evolved over the years into a group of both graduate and undergraduate students that come from across campus. We, I, I make. I, I'm very intentional in trying to reach out across the campus community and not just serve art and design students. Um, I think for art and design, it can be really easy to operate in this vacuum where everybody loves art, but you don't have that once you leave the university. And I think it's really important to also cultivate um, collectors and art appreciators. And these community projects are a way to do that. And in fact, um, Zoe Hayes that we have here today is a nursing student, I believe. What's your major? Medical Laboratory Sciences. <laughs> Thank Close. you. Yes. <laughs> and lastly, I want to say that this year, um, Shift Space was awarded the Mary Joan Wade Fellowship through the WSU Foundation that allows us to give a fellowship to a graduate student each year in the amount of $1,500. So a graduate student that's interested in arts administration can come work for the gallery and get this kind of real world experience with us through that. And that is all, thank you. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Now you'll open up the floor for questions, starting with Vice President Gums. Um, so just for clarification sake, I'm just wanting to know, so is Shift Space currently functions as a department within the College of Fine Arts, or does it function as a student organization? I report to the College of Fine Arts. I report up to Jeff Pulaski in the School of Art and Design and Creative Industries, and then to Rodney Miller. But the Shift Space gr student group is who runs the gallery with me. Uh, any other questions for the group? Uh, Representative Ramey. Sorry, I was scratching down a last word there. Um, thank you guys for your presentation today. I really appreciate everything you've been doing. So um, my only question for you guys, um, looking at your total expenditures and total revenue, there's about a $500, yeah, $500 difference between those. I do see that you guys have some reserves underneath that that could definitely satisfy that. Are you guys just, your plan is just to rely on those reserves if that doesn't match up all the way? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Representative Rongish? Yeah, so I wanted to ask you guys about the experiences and opportunities that you guys provide in terms of professional development because I know you guys work with a lot of artists and um, do a lot of stuff in the community and here and there and everywhere pretty much. So um, care to talk about that? Um, sure, I mean, I would say, and I, I tell the students that work with me all the time, I mean, nearly any time we're doing anything, it is a line on your resume and I can help them um, find the language for that and put that there. I am the manager of Shift Space Gallery, but I also have a part-time job in the uh, Office of Strategic Communications as a placemaking manager on campus. And I'm a co-founder and program director for Harvester Arts, a nonprofit space in town. So I really try to utilize my network wholly in the work that I do with the students that work with me and connect them across those channels and um, give opportunity. I mean, anytime you're programming or creating programs or bringing people together, that is, that's a resume line, right? So um, I try to stre stress that upon them. And then just the basic, like, you know, we have to 
um, change the gallery over. You have to take the work off the wall, package the work, return the work, sand and paint the wall, um, get the communications out about the next show. You know, all of that stuff too um, is also applied learning that you will be able to utilize down the road. Um, so, a question I have, um, going back to the first question you were asked, you refer to yourself a lot as the Shift Space uh, Gallery Student Group. So I'm wondering, um, if, is this stuff that you lined out in your budget, is that for the Shift Space Gallery Student Group, or is that for the other part you said you report to uh, Fine Arts for? I'm not sure. I, I guess everything we do is for the student group. Like I, and we're given autonomy, like the student group programs the gallery. Jeff and um, Dean Miller don't program the gallery. So we're given autonomy for our programming and the student group decides on the programming. So, and maybe if I'm not answering your question correctly, Maybe ask me in a different way because I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, no, you you answered it. Okay. Answered it. Um, any other questions for the group, uh, Representative Rangish? Yeah. So obviously, our job is to determine where, um, you know, money goes to different organizations. And uh, I know Wichita is big on art, and Wichita State has like one of the largest art collections, um, like sculpture collections and stuff, out of like any college campus. And I know Wichita does a lot of uh, community stuff through art. Um, but I was wondering if you wanted to, to speak about the, what value this adds to, to people who aren't in the arts, like just to general students who maybe aren't in the, the College of Fine Arts, but what value it adds just to campus as a whole. Sure, I mean, I think the arts can be really intimidating for people. And um, shift space, again, you know, I, I try to be really intentional and not gatekeepy in um, the programming that we do at shift space to make opportunity for students either to cultivate art appreciators and collectors or future artists and creatives in the community. And you know, I think the key to that is to create these sort of low stakes situations where people can feel like they belong and feel included in the space and not talk down to or <laughs> like they don't understand so it's not for them. Um, there's room in the art world, quote unquote art world, for all types of practice, all types of makers and, and all types of, you know, audiences as well. So I really try to stress that and create kind of entry points for people so that they can touch in and be involved in the gallery in whatever way um, they feel comfortable doing. And if that means making a sunflower <laughs> and then seeing sunflowers in our parade, if that means that you know sometime down the road they see the Shift Space logo somewhere and want to check out a show we're having, like that's, that's huge for me. Th those are the kinds of relationships we're trying to build across the community to show people that our doors are open to them. Um, so my next question is, what do you think separates you from an RSO or reg uh, registered student organization? Um, I, I mean, we are RSO. You mean separates us from other RSOs? Um, well, I mean, I think our intentionality, like we, uh, we are really, I, I recognize that student fees pay for us to exist, <laughs> pay for my job, pay for the building or the, the rent for our space. And those student fees come from across campus. They don't just come from art fees, right? So I'm very intentional in our programming to make sure that we meet, uh, and are good stewards of that money and meet the needs of students across, across campus. I'll also say prior to coming to Wichita State, I taught art appreciation for 10 years at Butler and often to students that didn't particularly <laughs> wanna be there and uh, was asked a lot um, what the point was. Why do we have to take this class? And the point is, the point of art is enrichment. And I, I strongly feel 
that the point of art is enrichment and it's a vehicle towards belonging. It's a way for people to come together and feel like they are a part of something greater than themselves. And that is our my, kind of my whole vision in the way that I lead this team. Any other questions for this group? I can't read it, but what was your Altenburg. Altenburg, Representative Altenburg. There you go. Okay, I just had a question for you um, regarding your numbers. So in Section 8, you just said prior to the pandemic, we saw upwards of 1,000 students a month coming through your gallery, um, which is really awesome. So I was just wondering, like, how you guys are working to get your numbers back up now that there is starting to be more participation in various things, and if you could mention, like, some of the partnerships you're currently working on as well. Well, I, I don't know that we'll ever get back up to those numbers. Um, anybody that does events anywhere knows that, that it, it's just a very different situation now when you're programming events. But it, has, it is what has made us take our um, kind of partnerships across campus and try to intersect with people in different ways and different intersect with groups in different ways. Um, also, we moved. We used to be on Commerce Street um, in a much smaller gallery. And Commerce was where the sort of final Friday art crawl happened. And there were several galleries on that street. Um, as you know, development started to happen with the new arena and things started to change, we were already seeing lower numbers there. And we decided to move so that we could have a more suitable gallery for the students because the Commerce Gallery, I don't know if any of you were there, but it was basically a very narrow, almost felt like a hallway and half of it was windows. <laughs> so it wasn't a great space. So we were able to move into Groover Labs um, into maybe three times the space for the same rent and be enmeshed in this maker space. Um, and we made that move right before COVID happened, basically. Groover Labs really opened up right before COVID happened. So everything has been kind of stalled. I'll say that we haven't stopped programming. We programmed co steadily through the last two years, you know, every month with new, different exhibitions and events. Um, and to answer your question right now, um, well, like I said, I'm, I'm looking to kind of solidify this uh, partnership with Go Create for the Sunflowers. We definitely, I, you know, I, I meant it when I wrote a grant to try to start a new tradition for homecoming with the Sunflowers. We will continue that. Uh, I'm sure um, we'll be involved in the Juneteenth um, celebration this summer again. We, we love that. I love parades. I've been involved in parades for years and years and years. I think it's a great kind of vehicle for community, uh, kind of creative community action. Um, I'm also getting ready to write a grant with my other hat on for what's called a reimagined space to make a sort of immersive, interactive space. If you guys are familiar with Meow Wolf or Factory Obscura, that sort of space over on the innovation campus and undoubtedly the Shift Space student group will somehow be involved in that. Um, yeah, am I forgetting any partnerships, anything else we're doing? There's an arts market that is being planned um, by ADSI students that I'm sure we'll try to lift. Oh, and is Laura Cunningham here? I haven't met her in person yet, but um, the I'm on the University Sustainability Committee, I think is what it's called, the Earth Day Committee. And Laura has come to those meetings a couple times and there is a SGA appointed group that's going to be leading some sort of programming for Earth Day and Shift Space intends on trying to lift those efforts as well. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for this group? All right, seeing none, thank you so much for your time and your presentation. Thank you. All right, so um, that is the last presentation for today. If I can find. Um, so before we close out, 
I know that earlier this morning, Dr. Hall, um, Dr. Hall um, told us that the passage to success enhancement won't be presenting. Um, and I think with the amount of um, presentations that John Lee has for Campus Rec, I think we should still meet at 9.30. And Gabe, if you could tell him to meet us at 10 o'clock rather than 10.30, um, that would give him enough time to um, present everything he has so he doesn't feel rushed. Because um, I don't think 15 minutes is going to be able to uh, speak on everything that he uh, Oh, um, that he has to present. Um, so we're still going to meet at 9.30 tomorrow morning um, with the first presentation happening at 10 o'clock from Campus Rec. Is that all right with everyone? We're all good? All right, sweet. Um, with that being said, there are no... Oh, Dr. Hall. I have a the president's executive team meeting tomorrow morning that usually concludes around 10 o'clock or thereafter. I will join you all as soon as we're through. All right, thank you so much. Gabe, did you have something as well? Um, Zach said this earlier, but if you have any additional questions that you didn't have time to ask um, in today's hearing, if you could email those to him uh, before it gets too late uh, so that we can send those out to those areas to be able to respond to before we go into deliberations tomorrow, that would be helpful. Um, and. I just checked to John, he will be here at 10, so we will start then. Um, and then the other part, um, as you all continue to go through um, through these, uh, we will start deliberations immediately, or immediately, right after lunch, we'll go to that, what that process looks like uh, as well, so just be prepared for um, that once we're done with hearings in the morning, we will immediately jump into uh, the deliberations, and for those who have asked, until we get a budget that we all agree on and vote on, um, then we won't adjourn the meeting until that time comes. Um, my hope is that we won't go till midnight, right? I don't think so. Um, so we'll be effective in our time uh, that we have tomorrow as well. So that's all I have. Uh, David. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there is a question this morning that I couldn't answer uh, for the specifics of the number of, of employees that are covered through the, or included in the market-based pay. Uh, number of 23,500. So the number of employees is 13. And uh, the other thing that's probably important for you guys to know is when we do these calculations both on this and uh, the potential compensation increase, uh, we prorate those amounts based on the revenue mix within each program. And so what I mean by that is uh, if you take student health services, maybe 80% of their revenue is funded through student fees and 20% is funded through miscellaneous collections and other fees that they get. So we're calculating these costs just based on that portion that would come from their student fee receipts. So. All right, thank you so much for that, David. Um, seeing no further items on the agenda, we will begin with closing, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to committee regulations as set by the bylaws, the committee shall provide an opportunity for public forum at the end of each day of hearings. Uh, the association provided an opportunity um, to the community uh, to address the committee via Zoom. Advisor Fonseca, has anybody reached out? No. All right. With that being said, um, the committee will stand in recess until 9.30 tomorrow morning, but I ask you be here by 9.15 so we can gavel on time, exception for Dr. Hall. Um, we are uh, in recess. <laughs>